the level of uh, tragedy, the air is vibrating with all that, that I, I don't even have a, a proper word for it. It is just extremely, extremely sad. I think I never shed so much tears in my life. When we drove through uh, different towns on the way up to Lhasa, I have met, uh, I have met a group of children who they were, uh, who they were uh, standing uh, next to the military bus. And when the soldiers, they were throwing out the rest of the cigarette, I have seen a very young age, four, five, six years old kids were jumping, jumping and get the rest of the cigarettes in their mouth. So I don't know if uh, It's very difficult to say all this. What is worse, being tortured physically or mentally, which leaves you in more, which leaves you more uh, destroy, you know, which is destroying you more, and how far it can go, how deep it can go. There is always a straight streets. You don't have a bent streets because the straight streets is such a straight strategical, you know, you can see from every angle. Nobody speaks about politics. The conversation what you can have, it's a very down-to-earth, everyday, little, the, the small talk, the little conversation what you can have, because you never know who is, who is watching whom. And because even Tibetans are watching Tibetans, so you see that's how deep it goes. The, the destruction. When I went to Shigatse uh, and on the market, there is one marketplace, you know, uh, uh, and all the ladies were drunk. So the ambience, actually, it was quite jolly, <laughs> if we may say this one, because, you know, the whole place, the whole square was thinking of Chang because the government is distributing Chang. And of course, when you are drunk, you will not make revolution. I have I can't, I can't even imagine how deep the destruction can go. And 2005 was the year, probably one of the, 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 the last years that you could uh, go more or less visiting Tibet, if you can say this, more or less visiting Tibet, because the train arrived in May from Lhasa, that famous train, you know, and after uh, we know all the political event, the Olympic and everything, and, and, the, and the country is just more and more uh, shut down for outsiders. Um, I'm coming from Europe, and I have been uh, visiting uh, the Himalaya area now for 24 years coming and going and uh, since from my childhood I wanted to come to see the big mountains so I guess uh, through my life uh, time I had uh, the chance uh, to end up here uh, 24 years ago the first time and uh, it was uh, if I may say so love at first sight I suppose we Western people, we all have a kind of a story about, uh, about Tibet. But when it comes to the personal experiences, uh, that change, changes a lot of, lot, lot of things. So, Tibet. The country, what we all imagine, somehow, and we heard, we heard the most of us, uh, especially Western people, there are lots of, lots of stories about. And uh, everything I say, it's my personal experiences. That's very important to say. So when I was a child, I always wanted to see uh, the Himalaya. Don't ask me why. <laughs> and then when I grew up through my life, uh, through my lifetime, I have changed countries. Uh, and somehow the subject just came up 
just came up, just arose, arose, arose. And uh, one day, many years back, um, there was, there was a friend of mine who said, Judith, come, let's go to the capital and let's go to see, uh, let's go to meet with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I didn't have much uh, knowledge about uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, so, but I said, all right, let's go. And I remember to see uh, between the crowds, that was the first time that I ever actually met Tibetan people. And uh, there was a huge crowd and there was in the middle, in the middle, there was the gentleman that, that not very tall, but uh, such a bright smile, the smile what most of us know now today. And I couldn't sleep in the night. It is not a joke. It touched me uh, extremely deeply. Uh, and it was such a, such a bright smile, you know, a real human smile. Uh, so I suppose that was the beginning of the story. And some years later, I ended up in a, in a, big, uh, in a big gathering where His Holiness came and uh, gave a teaching. And that time that was one step closer, if I may say so. We Western people, we have uh, that kind of, um, how you say, a different approach. We have that, that mystical approach, that spiritual approach, and we all have some kind of mystic ideas about, about lamas and about His Holiness and the magic power of this or that or that. But I wonder sometimes if we don't forget the most essential ones, that uh, no matter what we add to a person, the most wonderful quality is of that person is to be a human being and especially a kind human being, which makes us, no matter what status we have, nationality we have, uh, gender we have, whatever, you know, which makes us uh, very, com very common, but on a positive way and put us on the same ground. And I think if I may relate that big teaching experience where actually His Holiness was, you know, sitting close to you and then you was, we, we are Western people, we are very privileged because we have most probably more access to His Holiness than, 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 than some of the Tibetans actually, for many reasons. And, uh, you know, and the first time I have seen that, 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 that wonderful smile, so it's just, uh, it shakes personally inside of me something. Uh, I am already a very emotional person, so that's like uh, it's just it's just coming, coming, and it is very difficult to handle. So that's uh, that's uh, like I said, this is again my personal experiences. And then. Then in 2005, I had a chance to, I don't know if it is called a chance after all, I had a possibility, let's put it this way, uh, to go to Tibet. Now, that's uh, the story of mine. It's just a story like many other people who had the possibility. I, I, I would like to I would like to use that word because uh, it's very important to to try to put things or words and use it on the proper way. So I had that possibility to go to to go to Tibet. I have been guided by people since back from the country I'm coming from. Uh, on the way, so I was actually in the very protected situation from the beginning until the end. But um, going to Tibet, it uh, shook down, it broke down all my all my imagination. I could, I could have before or illusions, you know. Uh, we, another side of the world, we used to have all the beautiful books full of monk pictures. Uh, lovely old people having the praying wheels and um, and all the beautiful landscapes which are just absolutely breathtaking and majestic 
And I do believe that this is what is above all human being, <laughs> that power of nature. But coming down to the human level, when I crossed that border through Nepal, I don't know if other people, they could sense it, but me personally speaking, I have sensed it was like a curtain. I came from Nepal side and, uh, and just, I had to, I, I asked to stop the car when we actually literally closed the border, which was already not, not, not very obvious without uh, getting into details because I was an individual traveler and individual travelers are highly, uh, highly surveyed because you can get lost much easier than a group. So you actually, you as a one little human being, one little single one, can cause quite a damage. That's the belief from another side of the border. So speaking emotionally, uh, which I just can't separate from the things I have seen, um, it was just like a shower of sadness. I think this is it, a shower of sadness, which is just, which is just loading you down. It, it was my, my feeling from the very beginning until the end, that sadness. I don't know, I think that sadness contains all the different level of tragedy what we can witness or we cannot witness directly or indirectly yeah, when we enter into Tibet. So Tibet is not a touristic country. If anybody would like to go for touristic reason, I, uh, <laughs> I can say that uh, this person should not go because it is not, not a touristic place. It is, uh, it is not fun. It is not about uh, gastronomical tours because, um, because uh, the level of, uh, a level of uh, deterioration, the level of uh, tragedy, the air it's vibrating with all that, that I, I don't even have a, a proper word for it. It is just extremely, extremely said. I think I never shed so much tears in my life than I was shedding so much, that much tears. Yeah, like, you know, it was buckets. I could fill up buckets, you know, how much I cried through that month. So I remember when we started to drive after the border and then you come to the high plateau area, it looked very colorful which was extremely bizarre. I said, in such an altitude, there are no flowers. So, uh, indeed, there were no flowers. They were all different colors of plastic bags, so they were uh, floating around, which is, uh, which is extremely disturbing uh, because we, are, we can see how much it is polluted, how much is it, uh, how much is it uh, empoisoned to the nature on that level. Um, in uh, big towns areas, the, the load, the tons of garbage, the, the, the waste, which is just simply not cleaned up. And you have a pollution, an empoisonment, I think in every level, what is imagined. I don't know if I'm expressing myself properly, but for me, that was it. When we drove to uh, different towns, on the way up to Lhasa, I have met uh, I have met a group of children who they were uh, who they were uh, standing uh, next to the military bus, and when the soldiers they were throwing out the rest of the cigarette, I have seen a very young age, four, five, six years old kids were jumping, jumping and get the rest of the cigarette in their mouth. So I don't know if uh, it's very difficult to say all this, all this, all this, all these uh, stories. These are just just a small stories, you know, which are just staying in, in graved in, in, in you know, 
lived in the brain, in the memories for the rest of your life, because these are things which are just uh, turmoiling after for the rest of your life in your head. And then I have seen, I have seen a little gang, a pinshigatsea, all kind of different age. And these children, they were, uh, and teenagers, they were just like a herd of wild dogs, you know, just roaming around. They were dirty, uh, they had no teeth, uh, some of them were smelling from alcohol. Uh, and it was a kind of, which, which, which was very surprising me, you know. Uh, I had that image, like I suppose many of us in their mind, that, 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 that compassion, general, compassion and, then, and all these, these lovely images, you know, what we imagine about Tibet. And then I, have, I, have my, I'm, I find myself in front of this little gang, these children, they were aggressive. They were aggressive, they were teasing you, uh, and you know, they, they literally pushing you. It is so much savage spirit in these, these children. It's like, like little wild animals. And you realize that, uh, that, that all the images, what you had, that peaceful, whatever images, you know, it's just tumbling down one by one. And uh, you see human beings to get psy psy uh, psychologically destroyed. And sometimes I was wondering what is worse, being tortured physically or mentally? which leaves you in more, which leaves you more uh, destroying, you know, which is destroying you more and how far it can go, how deep it can go. And in that time I started to question, what is the, what is the price of a life? What, 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 and what is the cost of one life? And then when all these questions are coming up, you see, uh, you just, you just can't close your eyes anymore. Uh, you can't just go back as it was before. So on the way, um, and I have many sad stories like this. I mean, you just stand there and then you don't know what, what to do. There was one old lady at Shigatse when I was doing the Kora around the Tashilompo. And she was coming, uh, she was coming and she was asking me to come to have a tea in her, in her house. And I was terrified for her, not really for myself, because what can happen to me, you know, in the worst case, they guide me, they said, please leave the country. Well, you know, uh, she was such a small, <laughs> at least one head shorter than me, with a big smile, and then just came out from the blue, uh, you know, uh, a little lady, you know, and then, and then just coming quite nicely and very politely, you know, and pisho pisho, come, come to my house and have tea, have tea. And I just, I, I, it's, just, it's just very difficult to refuse such a warm invitation, you know, such a heartly invitation, but you have to refuse because you don't know what is the consequence after all. It's very important to know that when we Western people in that time, we could get, uh, you know, a visa and you would visit. We are under the survey, uh, may I say 20, 20 on 20, 24 on 24. You have cameras everywhere. There is always a straight street. You don't have a bent street because the straight street is strategical, you know. You can see from every angle. Nobody speaks about politics. The conversation what you can have, it's a very down to earth, everyday, little, the, the small talk, the little conversation what you can have, because you never know who is, who is watching whom. And because even Tibetans are watching Tibetans, so you see that's how deep it goes, the, the destruction. And because, uh, you know, uh, it is important to see the things from every, every angle to understand the situations of the people and the positions the people are taking. You know, for, to be able to survive, we human beings, we are ready to do many things. You know, it is, and when we come to that point that by surviving we have to choose and take decisions which are somehow we are not agree with, it's extremely sad. I do believe that it is almost, it is tragic. 
but who can be blamed for what, you know? When I went, when I went to Shigatse uh, and on the market, there is one marketplace, you know, uh, uh, and all the ladies were drunk. So the ambience, it, actually, it was quite jolly, if we may say this one, because, you know, the whole place, the whole square was thinking of Chang because the government is distributing Chang. And of course, when you are drunk, you will not make revolution. And I think sometimes that um, the people, some of the people, they must deliberately drinking now, you know, just to try to forget the reality, which even me, the little I have seen, because I have seen only the surface, you know, I have, I can't, I can't even imagine how deep the destruction can go. Uh, I don't know. If, I don't know if this is still good to add one more story uh, about my little stories I have seen, which are absolutely uh, not uh, not joyful. I remember one thing, which um, when you are coming out from the the main squares or the or the places which are the main attractivities between Hooks, you know, of Lhasa, I got into a side place, a side square, a small kora, a small uh, stupa where people, they go around walking around and doing their prayers. And there was few little uh, bungalows or shacks, wooden shacks, you know, where uh, people, they were preparing uh, Maggie soups and, you know, just to have a little food. And as I was sitting there uh, and I speak very little Tibetan, There was a young, uh, a young woman was approaching to me, and she was, uh, she, she was asking me. Sometimes I wonder, if, you know, life is full of, uh, full of mystery. So that 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 young lady, uh, she asked me with three words of, uh, of English. Uh, she was asking if I go back, if I go to Dharamshala. I said yes, and, and she said to me, uh, "Please come tomorrow." She was asking, she was trying to explain to me. I don't know. I suppose that when you really want to understand people, you will, even if you don't speak the same language. And um, I came back next day. She gave me a parcel. She gave me a picture. It was her picture. On the parcel there was a name and uh, I, she requested me uh, to take that parcel to Dharamshala. So that parcel was my, uh, <laughs> my mission, which uh, of course, of course we, I took it no hesi without hesitation. And for a minute, I forgot uh, that we could be both, but especially her, you know, we, she could be both in danger if somebody would see us. I, I don't know, it's, if I may say so, uh, it seemed like that we just been in a bubble, a protected bubble for, for a few minutes. And there was nobody around, there was nothing what, what could exist to survey us, it just disappeared for a uh, for, for few minutes. So I took that, I took that parcel on the way back and um, and we never saw, of course, of course, we never saw each other back. I never returned, so I couldn't s say to her whatever happened, you know, end of the journey. So I took that parcel. We, on the way back, we crossed the the border, and as I was getting out from uh, from the car, I just put all my luggage, my my, my bags, and then and the parcel also on the wall, which I almost forgot, <laughs> and. Uh, I was in a panic, but uh, finally, yes, it was still there. When uh, 15 minutes, I came back. You know, I would not, I, I couldn't forgive myself if some, if that parcel wouldn't. So, 
And when I arrived to Dharamsala, I asked from the institution to call me, to call me a little girl whose name was on the parcel. And um, that was a that was a, a, a little girl came came out. She must be like seven. And uh, the ladies uh, from my side they explained to her in Tibetan where this parcel was coming from, from who this parcel was coming from. The lady, the young woman who I met in Tibet, was the was the mother of that of that little girl. And that little girl haven't seen her mother something four five years, you know. And what is what is the how a child can manage this, you know, for so long not to see his mom. And that child was just standing there, you know. I gave, I handed over the parcel. No picture was taken, of course, no trace. And that that kid was just standing there with the big eyes, you know, like stoned completely, you know, wasn't wasn't there to show any emotion, but you could see uh, how she was holding that parcel. And I, I can only imagine. I can only imagine, you know, how does it feels like, what kind of courage it's, it's demanded, you know, the trust the trust, because, uh, you know, there are so little foreigners visiting this country. How can you trust? You never know who is who. You are constantly in that, in that, in that para paranoia. You know, you, have, you don't know who is looking, who is watching, who is listening, who's speaking what language. You have no, we have no idea who is understanding what, you know, and then and then you just try to uh, slalom between all these, you know, to, to find the safest, safest way to do it, but to do the right thing. And the right thing in that moment was, you know, uh, to not to refuse that parcel, no matter what is in it. You know, you just, you just uh, simply take over the trust what that young woman was placing in me. And you just, you just do your mission because this is our human mission, you know, to, to help each other when, 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 we are, when it is necessary. So the little girl took the parcel, took the picture of her mother, who I don't even know if she remembers. You know, she only had a picture for after so many years. And then she's gone. So I don't know her name. I never asked in her name. And I suppose to not remember for her name, it was a, the safest thing for all of us. But it doesn't mean that, uh, that the trust what that young woman was placing in me, uh, it's forgotten. So you could see, and then I, then I have seen a bus coming, with the new coming children. And the youngest one was not even three years old. And these kids, they were not used to have a bus, you know, so they were, they were vomiting everywhere. They were sick, they were dirty, yeah, they were exhausted. But there was that little kid, that, that little girl, and uh, I remember she was wearing a blue jumper. She was the youngest one of all. And she's just looking at you like you are coming from another planet, you know, and so I had a little teddy bear, so she, she had a teddy bear. <laughs> so, and 2005 was the year, probably one of the, 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 the last years that you could uh, go more or less visiting Tibet, if you can say this, more or less visiting Tibet, because the train arrived in May from Lhasa, that famous train, you know, and after, uh, as you know, all the political event, the Olympic and everything, and, and, the, and the country is just more and more uh, shut down for outsiders. And uh, you can only imagine, like I said in the beginning, uh, how the destruction, how deep is going.
I think, of course, I only can think and imagine that uh, there is a level of uh, desperation that when, when, uh, when a mother has to give up a child because that child will be better off without her than with her, I think we are attend to a level of uh, of um, distress and uh, and tragedy because we are touching something which makes us common everywhere in the world. We all come from a mother, and uh, and I think there was never safest place. Most of us, anyway, we never felt safest than to close to that person or be in the arm of that person from whose body we came out. We can't have more intimate relationship on this, on this, uh, on this planet. And we all know about being, about, about a motherhood who gives, who is actually uh, giving birth, giving a life, it's also to try to, to, try to uh, take care of that little plant, that little flower. And sometimes, you know, uh, you just have to step back because, uh, and then send that seed, that little plant to somewhere else where the climatic conditions are more favorable. To assure, to, to, to assure the survival. And I think we have all heard so many heroic stories about women who they, uh, not to give up their child, but they put their child in the security, even if it was far away from themselves, which is probably uh, one of the most uh, generous and compassionate gesture what we can do towards to our own flesh and blood and this is what that was one of my feelings and, and, and experience with that young woman she was obviously uh, she was obviously uh, came to she was obviously came to to the reasoning that my own flesh and blood can I can continue, or whatever reason was it, you know, that that child will have a brighter future, can survive, and through that child, uh, a tiny part of uh, the Tibet is also can survive. Of course, she had no guarantee. She had no guarantee. I had no guarantee that maybe she was somebody who is, you know, working, you know, that, that we had no guarantee. But I do believe in the miracle of life that there are, there are moments when you just have to. You just have to accept, you just have to do it, you just, you, just, you, just, you just have to trust. Because when everything is going, you know, everything is falling apart, there is only one thing what left. It is, I don't know if it is a more hope or more just to have a, a faith in life that things somehow just will I don't know, uh, happens and, and I do believe personally that, that, uh, that life is full of good things and when you have such an opportunity like this, you just can't say no. And it's nothing to do with, uh, with uh, putting a good face or being in a good spotlight or whatever, it is just simply you come to the level when you really have to do your human duty. And the human duty, it is to be, uh, it is to be responsible, compassionate, to understand, and even if it is involved some kind of level of risk, you do it. You don't do it for you, but of course, automatically, because you are being used somehow, you are being a part of that, you know, transporting, even if it is just a small parcel, from a mother to a little girl who they haven't seen each other for many years and God knows if they ever gonna be, will they ever gonna be. And uh, she just put her faith in me. And I think there is 
no carrying that trust of that woman, I just could not do it differently. There was no no. There was, it was not, there was, the, the word no, it was not even mentioned. So the little girl, like I said earlier, I think, I don't think, me personally, I don't want to be very pessimist, but as the situation looked and as it looks today, I don't think that they will met. I really hope from all my heart. But at the moment, the chances are very little. So I guess uh, we just have to, we just have to trust and we just, we have to keep that belief that, uh, that somehow, somehow they will somewhere one day reconnect again. Why? And another thing is that uh, why people, they were risking their life and their children's life. I suppose um, there is, there is uh, many big differences between different civilizations and between different uh, societies. And I think uh, Tibet is one of the society who still thinks or in that time think for the long terms. So, and maybe probably true also, also Buddhism, where we have, you know, the time has a different meaning than in our Western society. I suppose you somehow live through, you survive through the younger generation and uh, the culture, an identity of, of a country, a nation, the people, and we all know, uh, after all, so many reports of human rights and Human Rights Watch and everything, so we know that the destruction which is going on inside, behind the walls, put it this way. Uh, so to survive that nation which is, goes beyond the individu individual, uh, you have to send your seed outside to survive. And of course, we all we, we can see and we all have heard so many individual tragedy. But I think the force is lying lying when many individual comes together and carrying the, the flame all together. And I think these children these children are the hope, the flame, the spirit. And the people from behind the wall, they put all their hope and, and, and prayers in these little seeds which are scattered everywhere all around in the world. And we can only trust like that mother was trusting me, you know, that beautiful flowers will come out of all of the seeds. Of course, we have no guarantee because we are all human beings and, you know, we can all caught up, even a Tibetan can caught up into everyday life and then, you know, uh, who wants to have a difficult life? Nobody wants to have a difficult life. So, so we have all the tendency uh, to, to get to the easiest way. And sometimes the past or the roots are just so heavy. It's just so difficult to get, go ahead. So we have sometimes moments, uh, we all, I have experienced sometimes, you know, I just want to cut, just that I could fly my own, you know, and then just forget about it. But you can't, you can't. I'm also a person who was, immigrating from one country or another. So I know that feeling, that kind of floating in the air. You belong, but not really. Uh, when you go back, you are not anymore. So you are, you are just somehow, you are ending up like, a, like a, a tree who has no roots, you know. Uh, you try, to, you try to, 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 to fix yourself or settle somewhere, but the past is there, you know. And you have the responsibility to, to carry on. And sometimes sh soldier, sh you know, shoulders are just very, a child's shoulder, you know, it's very little to carry such a heavy weight. So I guess uh, those who stay behind, it's extremely ex unimaginable, difficult, you know, clinging on a, clinging on a, on a hope 
that one day uh, the walls from outside will be destroyed. And then who are outside, you know, uh, they have lost so many behind. And sometimes you just don't remember anymore because you were just so small that you were just sent away and then and you survive and then, you know, you just re, uh, you have a new family, you, for many reasons, you know, uh, you have to uh, reconstruct a new family, you have to find your place somewhere else. So I guess uh, the situation is, uh, I think the word complicated is not even come near to. It is very difficult. Inside, outside, it is very difficult and keep it together. You must have tremendous hope, you must have tremendous, tremendous, yeah, hope. And devotion, yes, that's the word. Devotion and belief and strength, you know, uh, not to lose your mind and try to hold a whole country together which is scattered all over in the world. So, uh, I pray because nobody Nobody wants to have atrocity, nobody wants to suffer, nobody. When, when, when we have, you know, every mind who is, who is, or heart, heart, every heart, you know, who is bumping, you know, who is, who is still living, you know, uh, cannot, cannot just sit and go by. It will touch you, uh, any atrocity on this planet. And Tibet, it is unfortunately one of them. So I can only pray uh, that I can be a good, good human being and I can do what I can according to my uh, consciousness and according to my level to, 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 to see, uh, to see the, the, the bricks and the wall fall down. Thank you. But unfortunately, this is not only outside, it's also, uh, not, not only inside, but it also has a replica, like after the earthquake, outside as well, because, because, the, because how can you defend, it's become very difficult to defend, defend such an important cause, you know, uh, when uh, so many, when two, three generations is already burning outside, so how can you, really, really feel and understand and fight for the cause which is actually yours, but not really yours, because your parents, your grandparents are experiencing it on their own skin. So I don't know if time is working for or against Tibetans, because more time is passing, more generations is burning outside, more more people are getting far away, far away from, from, from their causes. And how can you explain for a child? How can, how, I have these questions. How can you explain and expect from a child to defend the cause of a country where he never lived in, where he, he only knows the stories, only knows the beautiful stories and of course, uh, who wants to tell the sad stories? Who wants to who wants to load the mind of a child with a tragical stories? But somehow, it has to. I suppose I am not a Tibetan, but you know, you have this. I have these questions every day. You know, how can you how can you find the middle way to how can you find the middle way back to that lost country or almost lost country, who who was once upon a time a free country. Whatever they rule, they had their own their own system, but it was a free country. And today, uh, today is not. Many years now, many decades now, more than sixty years is not. And uh, and all the all the blood was shed on that soil, and all the pollution, all the all the the, the destroying what is going on, and how far it can go. And I think most of us. On this planet, human being has, has a spirit which was not set up for such a monstrosity. I think most of us have no idea 
we just it, it's just unimaginable you know so um, I'm am s- sorry that my interview is not structured. It is, uh, but I think it is just impossible to, to for me anyway, uh, to talk uh, rationally about uh, about what I have seen, what I have experienced. That that feeling of being oppressed all the time and uh, and all this emotion, you know, we just we uh, just try to hold the whole things together. And uh, I pray, me, me, I pray personally and try to do what my consciousness is dictate. And if it comes somewhere, you know, I, I hope it comes some, somewhere, somehow that it will, uh, at the end, maybe it will do something. Thank you.